it's been extremely disruptive, of course. I mean, I think that that's the bottom line is kind of um, the consistency of what we had kind of forecasted. You know, you're, you try to forecast so that you understand the future and the future is completely upended. And so we've really tried to be as nimble as possible and uh, trying to understand how we can be relevant in our community. So uh, around Earth Day in April, uh, we did a campaign with Puget Sound Keepers Alliance and we gave them 50% of all of the sales that came through our website, which we saw a really good uptick. And the reason that we kind of did 50% was because we saw such a downturn in our wholesale sales. And so it allowed us to say, well, we normally sell our product to our wholesale accounts. We have all of this inventory let's work on trying to be, you know, you know, a good kind of citizen in our community and work with these nonprofits that are being hit just as hard as we are. And it was quite a successful campaign. And then we were able to, you know, hand over that money to Puget Sound Keepers Alliance, which allowed us to, you know, kind of leverage some of that conversation on social media around Earth Day, which we're already kind of committed to. So um, that was a a very good campaign. I think people really saw that that was something that was a genuine uh, kind of interaction with a local manufacturer and the local nonprofit. And we've worked with Puget Sound Keepers Alliance for uh, going on probably about five years now, so they're not a new partner to us. Uh, so that was one way in which we've been trying to work with other groups in the area. And the manufacturing, I think, is just ongoing, uh, just trying to be as nimble as possible. We're right now trying to front load our manufacturing for the holiday season, which we're hoping is going to allow us to be able to, you know, be a little bit proactive in getting that production done earlier than what we would normally do. But we're also then hoping that the holiday season is going to be good. So we're going out on a little bit of a limb to try to keep production going uh, when it's a little bit of a sl- um, well, not a little bit, a much more slow time for us. Well, one of the good news uh, looking forward is the fact that when these restrictions are lifted and when we get to uh, the later phases and people are uh, out and about and are able to congregate quite a bit more. And uh, there's some beaches uh, throughout California that are open. State parks have been opening up in Washington State. Um, you know, people who have been cooped up for so long are naturally going to want to get out and about and spread their wings. And it is a great opportunity to accessorize them, to give them what they need in order to do so successfully. And, um, you know, I think marketing in that direction would be very useful and having that be a part of the brand story and continuing to put that on the forefront, I think is very helpful as well, you know, as we prepare to move forward into the summer months. Um, I agree. I I think my one real concern is that uh, there's a large segment of the population that don't have any jobs right now. And what we're worried about as um, a higher price point product is that with that uptick of people being able to get out and move around, are they going to loosen their wallet and purse strings to purchase um, kind of a product that they may or may not really need? Uh, You know, when you really look at it, 
you know, do we really need one more bag in our life? And so we're really trying to figure out how to speak to being kind of, uh, you know, the environmental impact that we're causing by not creating a new bag for you to have at the beach. We're creating product that's already existing in the world. And so we're trying to talk to kind of the better side of people and how we're hiring, you know, American manufacturers and that the, so we're really trying to place ourselves as an alternative to many products that are out there that people can gravitate to. And I think that the conversation that we're really trying to hone is one of, you know, this really top product that's going to last a very long time. And by the way, it's environmentally friendly and made in the USA. And, um, you know, and also really talking up the point of, you know, your dollar is really how you vote and make change in the world now, as you know, we live in this consumer society and companies live and die with your votes and your votes are so important with that dollar. And if you want to see a society that values upcycling and repurposing and all of that, the companies that are doing that work really need the vote of that dollar to stay, you know, solvent <laughs> and applicable. So we're trying to have that conversation too with our community around, you know, we are doing this good, but we need your votes with your dollars to do that good too. And so uh, it's not a plea and not a guilt trip, we're trying to stay away from that, but it definitely is uh, kind of trying to be inclusionary and, you know, bring people into the conversation and have them be uh, part of the, the solution. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it's a ongoing conversation too. So how to, you know, make that, uh, plea, I guess, and kind of engagement. Well, and for those that don't know, that might be uh, tuning in, uh, Metamorphic Gear was founded with sustainability in mind. The, the entire premise of your brand is that uh, you upcycle sales um, that are still in good condition, but for whatever reason, they might not be of seafaring capability. Yeah. And otherwise, they would just be thrown out. They would be yeah. thrown away or burned or otherwise disposed of. Yeah. And you rescue them and you reclaim them. And then you turn those as the raw material source for your product, which is right. um, handbags of various sizes and yeah. various different utilities. And uh, in addition to which uh, you yourself uh, are an avid sailor, isn't yes. is that? Yeah. Uh, maybe share a little bit about your sailing experience. Um, well, my sailing experience started when I was born, I was born down in the Caribbean. Uh, my parents were uh, sailor hippies that had a boat down in the Caribbean. And I grew up and was born down in uh, Martinique in Port de France and uh, lived my first year uh, down in the Caribbean until I became mobile and my parents were so afraid of a mobile child on a boat. So they, uh, my dad is a deep sea salvage diver and had taught here in Seattle at Divers Institute of Technology. And he got a, a teaching job here in Seattle. And uh, that's what brought us here to Seattle originally. And uh, the, Ocean has always been a major part of my life and my parents and family's life. We, uh, I remember very early on uh, being quite 
taken by Jacques Cousteau and all of the advocacy that he was doing around um, the ocean and ocean con conservation in the early, sorry, in the 70s and 80s. And uh, I did a couple campaigns when I was probably about eight or nine years old around saving the whales and sending money to him for the conservation work that he was doing. And one of my prized possessions is a signed photo of Jacques Cousteau thanking me for some of my work. So it's been something I've been passionate about for a very long time. And when I was able to start Metamorphic Gear, that kernel of kind of being a, a conscious or kind of a you know, the triple bottom line economic structure of, you know, having the economic driver for a business is critical, but having it also be aware of the societal and environmental impacts that it creates uh, is a really critical uh, kind of look at companies now. And I think that that being on the ocean and understanding what's going on in the ocean as a kind of a health metric of what's going on for all of us is a really critical thing and it's really concerning for me around you know scuba diving and seeing a lot of plastics now in hawaii even when i go there to you know visit and enjoy a little bit of R and R with my family. There's just a staggering amount of plastics that I'm finding on the beaches there, and uh, it just concerns me as a parent what we're doing and handing off to the next generation. And I think we have a very limited amount of time to figure out these major structural issues around what we do with our garbage and the. The fashion industry has a major part to play with that. And I think we can definitely work on how to better that. And part of being on a boat and loving the ocean started at a very early age. <laughs> so. That's very cool. And con uh, conservation is something you built into your business model. And so it is. Of, the, of the sales uh, go to help efforts. Yeah. In we give, um, so we give a percentage of our sales to local nonprofit organizations. Right now we're supporting uh, Puget Sound Keepers Alliance with our annual giving. And we also give a lot of product to them for gift giveaways and uh, their auction events and for uh, participation awards and I mean they do a lot of cleanup like around the 4th of July on Lake Union and they do work uh, cleaning up the fireworks that are floating in the water and they do kayak uh, work and a lot of conservation work in the area so we really think that they're doing a spectacular job we've also worked with the Friends of Midway Island which do a lot of scientific support of the science research that's going on there um, and a lot of the documentation of the albatross issues around plastic pollution so we've worked with a number of nonprofit organizations uh, just mainly as a support to them and just giving them straight money uh, because of the amazing work that they're doing so on, uh, on locally, if people wanted to get involved volunteering in order to do cleanup efforts, um, what's the best way, what's a, what's a really great way to start? Well, I think um, the first is just kind of figuring out what you're wanting to do, what kind of impact you're wanting to create in your community. Um, you know, I think it's really great to show up at an event and you know do a one-time beach cleanup let's say but i think what really is needed in a lot of communities is sustained support from our community and being kind of a one-time uh activist uh is great but it's not what's needed anymore it's kind of an ongoing support 
So I think doing a little bit of research, finding out the communities and organizations that you would really like to be part of, and something that is close and local that is not a huge hurdle for you to be participating in whatever activation that they're doing locally is a really important thing. So, you know, we talk about nowadays a lot of the ability to like organizations that are on Instagram and Facebook uh, and you get kind of a feeling of doing some great work, but I think we really need to understand that the great work also is a physical nature also. And if that's just going into their office and assisting them at their office when we're no longer in quarantine, uh, that's helpful, you know, or going out and actually doing beach cleanups. We also support Earth Corps, which does a lot of uh, environmental restoration here in the Northwest, and they bring uh, young people from around the world. So we give product to Earth Corps and we go to their auctions and buy their ticket. That's Metamorphic Gear does. So, you know, finding organizations that you think are doing really great work and do your homework so that you feel committed to what they are doing and then jump in with those organizations. They love having people that are committed to what they're doing and love that kind of feedback and finding something that is not just a one-time kind of Earth Day, yay, I did my due diligence, right? We need kind of people that are out there really committed to what these organizations are doing. I would 100% agree with that. And um, I have a little bit of a background. I've worked with a number of nonprofits over the years. And I think I would I would 100% agree with that. Um, it really does come down to a shared passion and a shared commitment to a, to a common goal. And yeah. when you're able to apply that passion to something that has a measurable goal, especially, um, it's, it's very easy to make the leap to I'm a one-time weekend warrior to this is a lifetime commitment. And many doctors and nurses that I've uh, uh, co uh, collaborated and volunteered with over the years would say the same thing. They started doing a Doctors Without Borders or they started working overseas and now it's just a part of their life. They check out two or three weeks, you know, in the summertime as, you know, the, pan the pandemics notwithstanding, things are a bit different now, but many of them are over in New York, for example, um, helping out with the hospitals there. But in any case, it, it, it really does make a difference and can easily fit into anyone's lifestyle. Um, yeah, I think, you know, and I, I, I hesitate using the word habit just because habit in our society is kind of like my habit of drinking coffee <laughs> or, you know, it can be a negative connotation, but I don't think it's a negative connotation because my habit of going out and running every morning with my son is not a bad habit to have, but it's trained and not something that you can immediately expect is gonna be an easy thing to do, but you need to put it into your schedule as something that you're committed to doing to better your community. And I think one of the things that I've really found interesting coming out of uh, the coronavirus is a real passion that people are having around their local communities. I'm hearing a lot of people, you know, talking in a very different way around how to support local, you know, uh, businesses and local restaurants and how are we going to as a community rise up and be able to have a community that we really love and support and um, I think that part of that is how to create a habit of doing the work that you enjoy and having that be a consistent habit in your life um, you know and it's uh, an important one to be able to, you know, engage your community, your environment, your society at a very different level. And uh, 
I think that after the community is kind of released, it's going to be a really important habit that people kind of include. And I think the earlier you can include that in your new routines when you're kind of released from your <laughs> house or wherever you've been cooped up, uh, it's much easier to include it right from the get-go than it will be, you know, six months from now when you have gotten into a new routine. And uh, so I would definitely encourage people to engage with these nonprofits that are doing the work that you think is so amazing and kind of include yourself. Oh, 100%. I agree. And um, shifting gears just a little bit, I want yeah. I, I want uh, just to be sensitive to your time. Um, I am very curious because uh, you, how many uh, stores have you been in, or how many stockists do you currently work with, or on a wholesaling side of things, um, just physical brick and mortar? Uh, how many would you say you've had the last eight months uh, in total? So in total, um, and I will kind of make a caveat of this is we have two different kind of areas. One is wholesale and another one is uh, we work with in companies that are doing um, kind of consignment. And so we currently at the end of tw tw uh, 2019, we had 35 stores that were carrying us internationally. Uh, we have stores in Tokyo, Japan, uh, up into Canada, and over on the East Coast. Uh, and But our main area is from essentially Vancouver, British Columbia, down into San Diego. Um, and all of the stores except for one in Tokyo have been shuttered and closed. And the one in Tokyo, from my understanding, is actually even uh, there just recently, they've had to close too. And so, and I, I mean close, just they're not out of business, but they're definitely shuttered for the foreseeable future. And a lot of those stores have asked us if they could go online uh, and sell our products online. And so we've been trying to support those uh, stores that are taking our products online and selling via a different kind of platform uh, to reach out, which has been tricky because our product is kind of a unique, each piece is a unique piece because of the nature of being an upcycler. And so it's been a, a challenge to send them very consistent products because as you know, imagery and creating content photographically is time consuming. And uh, the more photos of unique, very cool products that you're having to manage on a website platform only increases the expense. And so we've been trying to you know, create very consistent products so that we can have like 10 or 15 of almost identical products that we can sell our partners and send to them so that they can put it on the website so that when someone sees an image that is metamorphic gear product with a black zipper and a yellow panel and a blue panel, that that's what the customer gets. And that is kind of not necessarily what our strong suit is because we have colors that run the gamut from our supply chain. And so we have the white sale, which you mentioned, which we're getting a lot of that material in, but we also work with a lot of truck tarp manufacturers and awning manufacturers for the uh, vinyl material that is kind of the outside, which is the really bright, beautiful, bold colors and kind of the waterproof aspect of our products. And then we're also working with uh, a lot of indoor gyms uh, for climbing and they've been closed. So our supply chain of 
all of our old climbing rope has been kind of a little bit more tenuous also, but fortunately we have quite a stockpile of material too. So it's, it's an interesting one to, you know, kind of feed ourselves through this uh, very unique time that we're finding ourselves and trying to support our stores in that way. So the move to digital has been, it sounds like it's been mostly positive and it sounds like a lot of the stockists that you have involved have taken to it as best they can. And in, in the foreseeable future, if, um, you know, if for example, maybe worst case scenario, some of the stores don't come back. Um, what does the look, what does the shift to digital look like for you? The shift to digital looks like we need to be a lot more um, responsive to our imagery, our photography, um, and you know, in the past, we worked with our storefronts or the wholesale accounts and our. Um, yeah, anyone that was selling our product, we were sending them very unique products. And with these stores shuttering and some of them not coming back, I've already had a few conversations with some of the buyers and owners around that they're not able to come back, unfortunately. And their margins are really tight and landlords are not you know, understanding or they are understanding, but they can't not, you know, take two or three months of <laughs> rent. And so um, I think that the difficulty is going to be seeing who does come back, who opens up. But for us, we're really seeing how to try to take very, uh, high quality images of our very unique products and then allow our uh, buyers and the, our community to purchase those products and know that the product that they see is what they're going to get even when it's a one-off. And when I say a one-off, it's not a one-off design, it's a one-off color combination and designs that are incorporated in our products because they're upcycled. So each one is a little bit unique um, and how to best leverage that uh, because it's a very tricky proposition to you know, be able to take a photo, put it up on the website, say, hey, this product is for sale. And then once someone clicks on that and purchases it, how does that photo then get cycled out so it's no longer found by someone else and then they don't experience the disappointment of not getting that product. And so we're really trying to understand how we can best manage that digitally so that uh, a product is not a disappointment to a consumer <laughs> because they fall in love with color combinations because it's your favorite color or, or that number is my favorite number or I get emails all the time about like, oh, I found this photo um, online. Do you still make this product? And it was from five years ago and I have never had that color again, unfortunately. And how do you not let down the customer, but say, oh, well, that's a one-off product that will probably not ever be made again in that color combination or that number combination from the sale and say, well, we do have this other product that could meet your needs, you know, and it's a high touch point, right? It's like, I get that email and then there's probably five to six emails with photos of alternate products. And so the cost of that sale increases exponentially from every touch point that occurs after that. And so 
it's great and I love being in touch with that customer, but now when it's eight or 10 or 20 of those conversations now a day, uh, my, my attention no longer is now to other things that need also my attention for the company. And so we're trying to understand how we can reduce those conversations a little bit and still serve our customers with that sense of being understood and, you know, taken, you know, note of and what their wants are and needs and still have the company function well. You know, that brings up a really good point. And um, I was watching the Vogue Global Conversation with Gabriella Hurst, and I was really uh, taken by how she responded to the question of transparency to the point where um, she has, uh, for her brand, it's called their, they call it their, I believe it's called the Garment Journey. And they walk a consumer from start to finish. Uh, this is the story of your garment. This is... Mm -hmm where we source our products. This is the factory that it's made in. This is how much electricity it uses. These are the people that touched it, physically made it. Yeah. Um, this is where we sourced the zippers and the buttons. This is um, how we then reclaim and recycle and, and push other product back into the production, uh, into the cycle itself, um, all the way to the stores. Here's how it got to your door. And um, it's really cool from a technological side. They put it all in a QR code. So you can do the QR code on the uh, tag and boom, it just takes you to an interactive experience. And yeah. it's, a really, it's a really great and a really powerful storytelling way of, of doing exactly what you described and saying, you know, here's the unique aspects of our story. And here's how we can continue moving that conversation throughout the different um, online, whether it's social media or the website or print pub brochures, anything you're sending out. I don't know what you would print out these days, but any other touch point that you would have for the customer. Um, yeah. Have you, have you ever considered maybe a, a garment journey or like a bag journey, the story of uh, how the metamorphic gear is made and how you can sort of consistently push that forward? We have, um, we've had a couple kind of how would you campaigns around um, there's a, a couple online and social media driven campaigns around like who made my bag, who made my jewelry, who made my clothes. And um, we've done some work around those aspects. Also talking about our partnership with like Refugee Artist Initiative, which is a local nonprofit that does um, a lot of work with local refugee women and men that are, you know, trained and know how to do production level manufacturing in home. Uh, they help them get a sewing machine and then we give them kind of the consistency of product manufacturing and they do some of our smaller products like our dop kits and wallets and stuff like that. Um, and we've talked a little bit about that. Um, what we've found as a hurdle to that is just kind of production costs of producing a high quality product. Uh, consumers really need kind of a high level of in the past, people have needed this. I think it's changed now when we've now post uh, coronavirus. I mean, you're looking at all of our late night comedy shows that are now done in the basement <laughs> of people's houses. And I think that people are okay with a lower budget uh, kind of interaction with people now. Um, but in the past, I think it was a turnoff uh, when people kind of showed up on kind of their cell phones and just were like, this is what we're doing. And I, we saw kind of a, a very low turnover when we would do those kinds of things about like behind the scenes. We didn't see a very good click through 
Uh, our metrics were a lot lower. So we didn't actually put a lot of money into trying to do that. Uh, but it's a great point, and we have been looking at doing it again because I think societally we've changed in the last two months where those kinds of behind the scenes and a little bit more low budget kind of videography and photography is now something that we're accepting. We're accepting it from, you know, <laughs> the late show and Jimmy Fallon and all of these other guys. So I think that it's allowed for brands to also do that. Oh, I agree. And especially now in a time where people feel so disconnected, physically disconnected. Yes. And, you know, it, it's, it's a bit of a different topic, but where, you know, depression is spiking and when people feel yes. a, a really pressing sense of hopelessness and yes. specifically in the fashion industry and specifically with independent manufacturers or in, independent makers and producers um, that don't have a safety net. Um, having any sort of, of digital or otherwise connection uh, with not just another person, but with something that offers hope is all the more important. And I think it will only be more important in the future. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I agree. Yeah. And so kind of looking ahead, um, sort of the last question that I did have for you is um, on the topic of, you, you mentioned Seattle Sewn and you mentioned uh, manufacturing specifically locally. I'm curious, uh, in your opinion and from what you can see, what does the future of manufacturing in the Pacific Northwest, specifically in the Seattle area, look like? And is it something that, that you believe is, can be easily attained? Yeah, it, that's a, <laughs> a really tricky conversation to have. And I almost, it would be one in which we could spend, you know, the next hour on and might be a, a good segment to have in the future. Um, but kind of in a nutshell, I, I think that right now there's some really interesting kind of aspects that are happening nationally and internationally. And I'll focus on just the, the hyper-local aspect uh, Seattle Made and the Seattle Sewn organization that's kind of under the Seattle Good Business Network is um, really working on some really profound ways to engage the larger community as a whole to kind of try to work on creating an ecosystem of manufacturing and sewing and soft good apparel manufacturing is all part of that. I think that we have for so long worked on the premise of that if I can find a good bargain on a product that I win and wherever it's manufactured, you know, it doesn't really have to worry me as much. And I think people are coming to the realization that actually they are part of the reason for that and also part of the change that can occur. And the more you can kind of advertise and talk about the local manufacturing and understand that the economy that you want to have locally the health of that economy is from the purchasing power um it's like just some of the conversations around where do you bank like some of the most profound things that you can do are around your banking systems like do you bank with one of the large banking companies that are national and international, or do you choose to bank with BECU or one of the other credit unions? And those kinds of choices actually have very profound implications in the greater community and the society that you wanna have. And I, I think that 
the more we realize how engaged we are, even when we're not like making choices to be engaged, just our day-to-day -day routines have real large, you know, impacts societally and that we can really have some change value. I think that uh, people really have that understanding or are starting to understand that at a real basic level. Um, I'm seeing people, you know, make choices uh, to purchase locally, to purchase from makers that they really like what they're doing, um, you know, save their money, hold on to it, and then when they know what they want, they make that purchase. And they're not, you know, kind of being pulled in lots of different directions to make that purchase kind of on a spontaneous or kind of non-thinking process now. And I have really been happy to see that. I think what's going to be really interesting is after the coronavirus kind of lockdown has occurred, are people going to you know, want to go out and make those purchases? Or are people going to be really nervous about their jobs and their income? And are they going to really hold on to their income for quite a long time? And that's what worries me more than almost anything else for manufacturing in the Northwest and also in the United States is that people, I think, are coming out of this really in a kind of a paranoid situation. Um, kind of touched on the depression and aspect of how people are feeling, but I think that there's also a certain level of paranoia and I, I'm worried that people aren't going to go out and start making those purchases and start, you know, voting again with their money around kind of the society that they would like. Well, and a quick a quick follow up to that is um, sort of on the topic of economic recovery, and um, if maybe we can think in in the the um, the big picture, but then to make it granular with the fashion industry, how helpful are things like uh, SBA loans, and how helpful are the artist grants? And um, uh, feel free to speak from your experience with your brand specifically, um, or yeah. just others in the network. Um, is this something that is genuinely stimulating economic recovery, or does this feel more like a band-aid? Um, does this feel more like we're we're still hemorrhaging here? I I <clears throat> so you're probably going to yeah you're definitely getting me on my soapbox here a little bit so <laughs> take that with a, a grain of salt but um i your your term of a band-aid i think is a very very apt one anthony i but the wound that that band-aid is covering is what is concerning me i think we've had a a mortal wound that needs some major surgery. And my concern is that we are treating it with a Band-Aid. Um, we have had a very deep to the bone cut with, you know, the analogy of the wound. <laughs> and uh, we've kind of thought, well, we'll just put a Band-Aid on it. And it really needs, you know, a high level of attention. And I'm not seeing that high level of attention. I think that what's really telling is with the federal loans that are being sent out for, you know, wage and assistance uh, to, small businesses that were really kind of taken advantage of at the beginning by some larger businesses that I think have, and my understanding is individuals that were hired within those companies and their business is to do that. So, you know, right off the bat, you know, you have companies that are applying to banks 
And the only way you can actually get the loan is by having done business with those banks. They were already favored. And the bigger the company, the more favored they were. So you have these companies that I think could have weathered the first part of this a little bit easier than some of the smaller companies. And that ecosystem of these smaller companies really getting hit. Um, and some of the numbers I've been reading is that of the, let's just say, of the 100 companies that are applying for this, only about 20 to 25 percent are actually getting these grants. So that's leaving 75 percent of the companies that spent the time to actually do these loans are getting it. And that's not even taking into account the companies that didn't even have the time or the ability to go through the process of trying to get the loans. And we don't even know those numbers. So my concern is that, again, we've had this very brutal wound to the manufacturing economy and just the economy as a whole. and we're thinking that these little band-aids are going to be able to, you know, slow down the flow of the, the, the bleed out. And uh, I'm really worried on a couple different levels without getting too political that the federal kind of um, work on that is not at, a level that's needed um, and is going to be too late, essentially. And we're, I think, already starting to see that, that uh, companies are starting to say that we're not going to reopen uh, and they're just starting to fold up their, their shops and they're laying people off, which already had occurred. So it's kind of this quiet storm that's brewing that no one really is kind of listening to the the owners and the companies that are just not, you know, coming back to business. And so in the next six to eight weeks, as these companies don't come online, we're really going, I think, to see the real full impact of the lack of kind of uh, attention to the the true mortal wound that I think uh, we've had inflicted on us. And, and this is not a critique on the fact that I think what we're going through was necessary. I think that sheltering in place and closing down the economy was really one of the only things that we could do without having the testing protocols that we could have had but we don't and so this is i think really the alternative but uh i think the the how we come out the other side um it's going to be really telling i think over the next few weeks about how that is exactly going to come out and i would encourage people to look at their budgets and see what they feel that they can spend on the local economies and not have it be a knee-jerk reaction that I can't spend any money and I'm very nervous, which is very critical and not to be, you know, under kind of not taken attention of or be aware of, but I think if you are doing well and you still have a job and you still are able to be working and have an income that you haven't been spending because you've been inside, I really encourage you to look at that income and see what you might be able to spend in your local economy. And if it's $100 or $1,000, you know, be aware of that economic value that you do have in your society, in your economy, and be willing to spend that and, you know, have kind of a truth conversation with yourself about what you are willing to spend in your economy and go out and spend that 
because the local economies, be it your restaurant or bar or your local upcycled bag manufacturer really needs you to jump onto that and, you know, be proactive and not wait out in a nervous condition what may or may not happen in the future. Well, I think that's fantastic advice. Um, and on that note, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate this talk. And uh, I'm going to publish this thing out as soon as I can. And I think this is very valuable um, for people to hear, especially in this time. I did have one last question, if it's all right. And yeah, I really do appreciate your generosity. And yeah, and I appreciate you asking me to be on. Uh, I think the work that you do locally here with your magazine and your writing is fantastic and i really appreciate you inviting me to be part of this well thank you and um you know if you had maybe one message to give uh to you sort of you, having just sort of spoken to consumers and saying you know what it, it, it things are going to be okay and, and consider what we can do now because it seems like it's up to us to make a change happen we we're, we're very empowered at this point to make change. Um, if you had sort of one, one sort of big message to give to the world right now, um, and it could be, a, it could be about anything. Uh, what's, what's sort of the most or one of the more important messages that, that you would like to say, or that maybe you think we need to hear during this time? Um, oh, wow. I think that we, are resilient beyond belief. I think that the love and the community that you have around you is resilient beyond belief. And I feel that the more you can engage with that community uh, and the society at large, um, that you can recoup and replenish your kind of economic, societal, and also your kind of state of mind, your mental mind. Uh, I really believe in our communities. And I think that as trying as this has been, I think that uh, relying on the community that you find yourself embedded in is so critical and leaning on the people that you rely on close to you, but then also finding the groups and the people that are doing work that you really like doing um, outside of work. And, you know, that can be religious, that can be, can be you know, environmental impacts. I, we talked about it earlier. I, I can't understate the importance of feeling uh, kind of engaged and trying to be uh, at cause and not feeling like things are being thrown at you and you really don't have any way to kind of change the outcome or the course of what's happening. Uh, I think it is a really critical component to at least feeling like you have some action going on, even though you're in your apartment or your house or, you know, able to go for a walk or whatever. Those are really critical aspects right now. And as these uh, restrictions on our ability to get out kind of start to loosen, I think it's really critical that we get out and be proactive and be engaged in our communities at large.